All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Innovation Bay's Wednesday morning event series. Uh, I'm your host today, Ian Gardner. I'm the, the, one of the co-founders at Innovation Bay and also a, a VC and an investment partner with uh, Gelix Ventures. Uh, also in the Innovation Bay team, we've got Faden Stow all the way in from Hobart, uh, who's my co-founder, and Shan Priest is our general manager, and Claire Tester is our event manager. So uh, we love doing this, uh, these events. I think this might be number 10, so we're, we finally made double figures, uh, and it's, it's kind of the highlight of my week, so I, I really, really enjoy it. So welcome. Um, after the sessions recently, we've been doing some virtual networking, so we're still not quite meeting up face-to-face. -face. Hopefully we can soon, but uh, for now we're using Discord. It kind of works. Uh, I've met some uh, amazing people on there, actually. I had a, a great contact uh, uh, last week, a uh, great chat with, with someone. So if you want to just come along and meet someone uh, great, um, please do it afterwards. So uh, the details are on the, on the page there. So... Uh, if you don't know uh, Innovation Bay and if this is maybe your first time, then welcome. Uh, we are the longest running community for founders and investors in Australia. Uh, we have a pretty cool mission, we think. We want to support founders on their journey from idea to IPO and beyond. Uh, we run a range of events. We've got a bunch of programs uh, and we produce content such as this uh, or, or a podcast or some other stuff. And it's all designed to enable uh, you, founders, uh, investors, anyone who's interested in the ecosystem to connect, learn and grow. So welcome along. It's great to have you. Uh, we couldn't do any of this without the support of our sponsors. Uh, so a huge thank you to AWS, IAG Farmark Ventures, uh, KPMG's High Growth Ventures and Macquarie Bank. Uh, thanks for the support of Innovation Bay and the whole ecosystem, in fact. So they, they do some amazing work out there to support the startup ecosystem. Um, all right, today's session uh, is uh, a sort of bit of a pet passion for me. I wouldn't say I'm an expert by, by any stretch, but if you look at my YouTube feed, it's just full of uh, SpaceX and the news and stuff that's going on in the space industry. Uh, I'm fascinated by it. I, I love it. So I was really keen to, to do this one. But the reality is, I mean, the cost to create and launch rockets uh, and satellites, you know, has decreased substantially over the last 10 years. Uh, you know, I think really SpaceX was at the vanguard of that, but you're seeing other companies that, you know, like Gilmore Rockets and Rocket Lab out the, uh, in New Zealand, uh, and Adam Gilmore is here today, so we can talk about that. And we're seeing, a, you know, there's a boom going on in homegrown uh, Australian-based space tech startups. Uh, SpaceX is a successful launch. Uh, they got uh, US astronauts launched from US soil, uh, which is the first time since 2012. So that's pretty exciting for, for the world. Uh, their Starship, if you look at the economics around their Starship, fully reusable uh, entire rocket system. So when you think about the impact of, uh, uh, you know, the implications of that, it is transformative. What does this mean for Australia? Uh, what can space-based tech be used for? Uh, what industries uh, are going to use it? Uh, and where do space tech companies find funding? Uh, and I guess, how do we continue to strengthen the Australian space industry? Uh, if you have questions, this is interactive, so there's a chat uh, function running. There's also a Q&A uh, button that you'll see down at the bottom of your screen. So if you want to get involved, please do ask a question. Uh, we'll try and get through as many as we can. Um, right, let me um, kill my rather unfriendly uh, uh, screen share and get back to the panel. Uh, and I'll just do a quick intro. Uh, Adam Gilmore, uh, welcome Adam, uh, all the way from Queensland. So uh, Adam is the CEO and founder of Gilmore Space Technologies, uh, which is a rocket company uh, developing a new breed of hybrid launch vehicles for small satellite uh, payload customers. So I'm sure we'll get into a lot more of that. I'm really keen to hear that. So welcome, Adam. Um, Flavia uh, Tata Nardini, I've known Flad Flavia for years. Uh, she is terrific, one of my favorite people in the startup ecosystem. Uh, Co-founder and CEO of Fleet Space uh, is an agile space company connecting the internet of things around the world using a massive fleet of small low-cost satellites. Great to have you, uh, Flavia. Nice to see you again. Um, welcome. And Martin Dersma, uh, one of my favorite venture capitalists out there. Uh, super smart, super nice. Uh, he is a partner at Main Sequence Ventures. 25 plus years experience. Uh, he must have started in his career when he was 10. Uh, as a senior executive technologist, business founder, angel investor, and a mentor is pretty well known for all of those things, both uh, in Australia and the US. And we do have a fourth panelist that I'll do a quick intro of, uh, who is the, the South Australian Premier, uh, Stephen Marshall. Uh, he's going to join us at 8.30. Uh, 
Uh, I think being premier of a state is quite a big job. So he, he was dragged off to something else a little earlier. So he is going to join us uh, around 8.30. Uh, Stephen is responsible for tourism, Aboriginal affairs and reconciliation, uh, defence and space industries, obviously the arts, veterans affairs and multicultural affairs. I feel I've been talking for, for way too long. So we should really uh, get to the, 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 the panel. Thanks for bearing with us, everyone. Uh, Adam, I might start with you. Um, uh, you know, let me just sort of couch this. I mean, I think some of us are familiar with the, the space race and what's been going on. And of course, the, you know, Elon Musk and his, this new race to Mars. Uh, but what, you know, what does space tech actually enable? Uh, you know, how can going into space help us as founders or uh, corporates grow tech innovations? And why should we go to space? I mean, it's a pretty broad question, but it's maybe a good one to start with you. Um, sure, I'll give it a crack. I think some of the technologies that um, space gives the community, people take for granted. I think the biggest one is GPS. So, you know, gone are the days where you have to ask someone for directions and they say, you know, you go three streets down, turn left, go past the McDonald's, turn right, etc. You just whack, whack out your phone, you dial in the new location and you go straight there. Uh, I think that's a game changer for a lot of people. Um, every time you get money out of an ATM, you're using satellite technology. There's atomic clocks in the GPS satellites that tell the time precisely that they can say, if you get it out of an ATM in Sydney and your money's in, in a Brisbane bank account, they know exactly when you took it out so it's precise. Same with the pay wave technology. Um, Australia is a big country. We have a lot of uh, emergencies, floods, fires. Uh, satellite technology allows um, people that are in emergency situations to see where, what's happening with the fire, what's happening with the flood. I found a very interesting um, point the other day when I was researching space technology that Australia has the most emergency um, locators that use satellite communication in the world, there's more than 10,000 of them in Australia. We're the biggest user of them. You know, people in boats and camping and stuff like that. If you go to industries, the big industries that can do a lot with um, space, um, historically has been farming. Um, farmers can get data from space that tells them how healthy their plants are, you know, how much fertilizer their, their paddock has, uh, how much water's on the surface. Uh, mining uses space to do autonomous mining. So GPS and other space communication allows these robots to go anywhere they want to go and communicate back to the home base. Flavia is on the panel. Um, her company does Internet of Things, but I think Internet of Things is a really big game changer for space because what it allows industries to do is to have sensors on anything. So you can have a temperature sensor, a water level sensor, a uh, a noise sensor anywhere on the planet and connect back to your home base through space. And that's really a paradigm shift in monitoring things. So people that are in Australia that are monitoring power lines and water pipes, uh, this is a real game changer for them. All right. Uh, thank you. That's a great overview. Uh, uh, Flavia, I might uh, jump to, to you. Uh, and I've, I've interviewed you a few times. Uh, you've been in the podcast. Uh, and I love the story. So I'm not going to ask about the, the whole Genesis story. I mean, I think we're, we're beyond that now, but I, I kind of want to talk about fleet. Um, as, as Adam alluded to, you, you are really an IOT focused business. Uh, and you still are. Um, you talked about building a better internet uh, or a sort of rethought internet. And now none of this vision works without, uh, a, a, you know, space and satellites. Uh, you know, where does fleet fit into this? And, and why are you so passionate about the, the, the space industry? Listen, why am I so passionate about the space industry? You know, Adam is right. Space industry helps the world heavily. But I mean, my drive is having worked in the space industry for a long time. I know how complicated space is. So I know that when we try to do something in space, we really push the edge of technology so high. The repercussion of what we learn is it, it helps the world. Why do I like space? Because... If you look at Earth and how amazing this planet is and how complex it is, the best way to look at Earth is from the top. 
it's it's just what it is. I mean, like, and uh, when we when I founded Fleet with Matt, uh, the dream was to build the most amazing satellite constellation to give internet from space, and it's um, the reality that is is a, is a shared dream. Like, you know, many in the past have tried to do it, and many have failed because space is difficult. And most of the satellite company in the world go up there and go bankrupt. And then they restart it and they go bankrupt. And then they restart and they invest a billion dollars, they go bankrupt. So it was, it's been a vicious cycle for hundred years, but now technology has allowed you maybe not to do that. Maybe create a network that is more scalable, is well thought, is more relevant. And suddenly see the word from the top. It's, I'm, I'm not just saying about Earth observation, I, I'm talking about comms, I'm talking about internet, not fleet does internet of things, but the, the fascinating things is what we were not able to do before. You know, why do I like industrial IoT? Because it's completely unconnected and I'm, I'm absolutely believer that every big change in the history of time is driven by connectivity. Like the industrial revolution allow us to use computers and iPhones and, and do all the fancy fancy stuff that we do at work. Now another one will come to change industries forever and change the way we, we do things forever. So space, it's hard. But space is so hard that when you actually do it, you create a game changer. This is why for me it's worth it. Yeah. Look, um, Martin, I do want to jump to you, but I, I, just before I do it, uh, I think I was remiss in really not getting a bit of the, you know, the, the, the story about what these these two founders companies actually do. So, I mean, Adam, do you want to just give the, 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 the quick snapshot? What is Gilmore's business model? Okay, so our business model is uh, we, we started with thinking rockets were too expensive and figured out ways to make rockets a lot cheaper. One of the most expensive things on a rocket is the actual rocket engine. Uh, so we've got a reasonably unique propulsion system called the hybrid rocket system. Uh, and that's with a liquid oxidizer and a solid fuel. And that's allowed us to develop high thrust, uh, high performance engines, relatively cheaper compared to most of our competition. And we have a whole philosophy of design for cost. Uh, so we're trying to design a vehicle that is the simplest possible and, and as cheap as possible. And the market that we're going after has just grown, you know, a hundredfold since I started the company. And that's all these small satellites. So we have a capacity to take 200 to 250 kilogram satellites uh, into space with our vehicle. And there's a lot of constellations that are getting built now that are in that kind of size class. Some of our other competitors in the world uh, are not big enough to do that. And I think this is the real big opportunity to, to service these big, big satellite constellations because once they go up, they don't last forever. They only last between five and seven years and they don't all die at the same time. So, you know, 30 or 40 will go up in one orbital plane and two of them will die at one point in time. And that's where we come in to take those replacements back up to keep yeah. the constellation in place. And have you got any element of reusability? You know, like you know, SpaceX is now famous for landing its boosters again and again. We don't right now. It's, it's on our development path. But if you look at SpaceX, he spent uh, $300 million developing the Falcon 9, then more than a billion dollars making it reusable. So we're kind of think, saying, let's get something to space first. Let's prove the tech and then we'll make it reusable. But we're looking at it already, how we can do that. It, it does look difficult, I have to say. Uh, and, and Flavia, just quickly, um, you know, how do you make money? How do I make money? I make money out of uh, energy companies mainly, uh, gas pipelines, distribution networks, and uh, you know water utilities that have got massive assets in the middle of nowhere, completely dark assets that they cannot measure, uh, they cannot control, they cannot. It's just fascinating. It just it's just fascinating how we live in 2020. So the idea of connecting all these assets is creating a network that is able to do. Um, able to bring the cost down, able to bring the technology, make it them relevant. And so we are doing it from space. And uh, yeah, so it's cool. Great. All right. Look, uh, uh, sorry for the delay, Martin, but uh, I thought that was good. Of just uh, the, the, the founders context out of the way. So really keen to hear the investors view of the, 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 the space industry. So yeah, do you want to take that one away? Yeah, thanks, Ian. So look, maybe I'll start with a quick word on who main sequences. We're an Australian venture capital firm backed by the CSIRO, who are the general partner of the fund. We've raised $240 million to invest, and uh, we have both uh, the federal government and CSIRO as an investor in our fund. But the majority of our capital... Martin, just jumping in. I mean, it's also worth... I don't know whether you're going to say this, but your, your name is space-related. Is it? 
Yeah, main sequence stars. Oh, of course, yes, absolutely. From the front, you can see that we have a thematic around space, and we're pretty keen about that. And it wasn't so, um, from Dersma. I don't know where that's got space. Uh, that's definitely not space. <laughs> that's, that's Dutch related, so uh, that is not space. So yeah, so look, um, we're a venture fund that definitely has a space thematic. Uh, we back early stage companies on a deep tech, uh, connected to publicly funded research and solving wicked engineering problems. Now clearly, space is one of those wicked engineering problems, as Barbie said earlier. It's a, it's a very difficult area. Now, we've invested in 25 companies, of which four are space-related, which is Mariota, Gilmore Space Technologies, Fluorosat, and Advanced Navigation. So three years ago, when we started Main Sequence, we had this theme around space. And really, it's around what some of the panel members said earlier, that we believe that you know, companies like SpaceX and Rocket Lab are now the major movers and market makers in the space industry. And this has proven that um, innovation and space related technologies is no longer just solely the remit of US defense contractors, but is now an expanding ecosystem of new players, like some of the companies that uh, we have here today. So coming back to an Australian context, what we're seeing is that I, I'd say that we're starting to see green shoots appearing in the Australian space ecosystem, and it's, but it's still early days. I think we're yet to get to what I call the space flywheel effect which is where we have a self-sustaining set of companies, part of a maturing supply chain, feeding off each other and solving the technical challenges in, a, in an Australian sovereign context. And it's the immaturity of the local supply chain that means that many of our startups today are forced to use overseas suppliers for critical aspects of their solution. For example, some of our startups today are having to go overseas for certified uh, satellite components, or launch services, and you know, Adam clearly, Gilmore is trying to solve that launch services component of our ecosystem. So we need more local suppliers to energize the ecosystem. So how do we get this flywheel effect going here in the local ecosystem? Well, one way is to better connect the components of that ecosystem. So when we started our fund, we noticed that the space startup ecosystem wasn't that well connected. The startups weren't that connected to research or weren't that connected to primes of customers. So in conjunction with the CSIRO, we've been running a series of workshops over the last few years, connecting the startups to research, startups to prime, startups to customers, and more recently around the space missions that the Australian Space Agency has been promoting. So now as an investor, we have a very selfish motivation for these workshops because, you know, we're trying to get the ecosystem together so that hopefully we can find more companies that we can invest in. But the challenge that we see continuously in the space startups that come to us for investment is that they typically have a great technology idea, but they're always not too sure about who their customer is and how they can charge for that solution. So as a venture capital fund, we're always looking for companies that can actually in, you know, drive product outcome that have a technology readiness that's relatively high six, and that when we can invest in them, they can ultimately build a business that for venture could ultimately scale to many hundreds of millions of dollars if that company is successful. That's the lens that we use. And so another way to move that space flywheel is around customer demand for space solutions. And I think here there's a really important role for government to play where the government, government generally can act as an initiator where the program solutions that it's seeking are actually gonna force collaboration, bring companies together. A great example is that some of you may be aware there was a tender that came out in May around a NIC SAT tender from O&I. And I and i know that's encouraged a number of companies in the space ecosystem to work together to collaboratively come up with you know, opportunities for that tender. So I want to finish off my sort of initial thoughts on investing with an example of company to company collaboration and where I start to see the space flow we're really starting to move. So in our portfolio, we've got two companies that may not appear to be space related, but in fact actually are. And so one of those companies, Q Control, they're a supplier of quantum related solutions around air correction. They stabilize qubits and quantum computers. And another company, Advanced Navigation, they're a manufacturer of inertial navigation systems, the so-called black boxes that are inside aircraft, submarines, and spacecraft that allow that craft to, in question to navigate without the need for external signals like GPS. So these two companies have teamed up together and they're taking their two solutions and they're building a, a joint solution, which is gonna use quantum effects to add that to IMS to build a super accurate navigation system for future spacecraft. And this is going to be 100% developed in Australia and built in Australia. So that's an example of the ecosystem starting to get together and working and supporting each other. We need, we need more of that. So I think you can see I'm pretty excited about you know, opportunities for the Australian space ecosystem. We've got some great innovations here in Australia. Australia's, a, Australia's come up with great unique ideas. 
we can couple that with the customer side of things. And I think we're going to have some, you know, awesome space startups and space businesses that are coming out of Australia. And, and I think Sorry, I was just going to ask, like, I mean, most VCs have got a 10-year uh, fund horizon. I mean, I, I don't know whether, uh, I, I can't remember quite how main sequence is structured, but it's 10 years enough time to get a, a space startup from gestation to outcome? I think 10 years is about the right time, Ian. If you look at SpaceX, it took them about 10 years to get to where they got to, and then they became an overnight success. So it's definitely a long burn for, um, this, especially space, and space is deep tech. You know, deep tech companies take a long time to finish off their productization, get those first customers, get that early market success. So yeah, absolutely, we're in, there. We're in it for the long haul. All right, no, that's awesome. Look, thanks for that overview. Um, look, Adam, I might uh, jump back to you. Um, <clears throat> I mean, one thing you didn't mention is that your background was uh, as a banker. Um, so, uh, you know, how does a banker become a, a, a rocket scientist come, you know, Elon Musk style entrepreneur? So, uh, you, you know, <laughs> the reusability and your product um, pipeline or product uh, development path but what else is coming so background and what's coming yeah i think well you know elon was a software guy before he started a rocket company so i think you know it's good to not be a rocket guy when you start a rocket company um i think as a banker you know i was in financial markets which are very very complicated products and some of the mathematics of a derivative is pretty similar to a rocket equation. So mathematics was a piece of cake. Uh, and then the second thing in banking you learn, I think in many industries is if you don't know how to do something, you find the people that have the talent and you hire them as a team. So I did a lot of research flying around the world on business trips about all kinds of space technology to get a business plan together that I took to some early engineers and said, this is my idea. I've got some money. This is how I want to roll it out. And that's how it started. Um, we, we have a lot of long-term plans in the company. I started the company to take people to space. So our long-term goal is to take humans to space. And we believe we can. We believe our technology works very well. It's very safe. Um, our rocket technology can't blow up like some of the other rocket technology systems can. Um, so, you know, hopefully 10 to 12 years down the track, we have human space flight as a product that we offer from Australia. Uh, we're also very interested in um, moon and asteroid uh, economies. Uh, I think there's going to be a lot of potential in the, you know, in the next 50 years at least of, of people setting up bases on the moon, on asteroids, mining them for materials, and really like an economy that grows in space. It's often called Space 3.0, and we want to be one of the enablers of that. Okay, that's pretty cool. Uh, well, I might use that to to sort of segue to, to talking about SpaceX because I'm mean, talking about um, different mining and whatnot. Um, <clears throat> I mean, SpaceX is definitely a, 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 you know major player in this industry. Uh, I mean, they've invented Starship. I alluded to that in the the intro. It's fully reusable. Uh, you know, it's going to be able to carry hundreds of people. <clears throat> Uh, he's now, <clears throat> excuse me, he's now launched Starlink, which is this constellation of low Earth uh, satellites. He's talking about getting a colony of up to a million people on Mars. So, I mean, who, who wants to talk about the impact of SpaceX on, on this industry? Because I, I don't think we can, uh, we can ignore that. So I guess I'll ask Fla Flavia, you're off mute, so I might uh, pick on you. Listen, um, the reality is that it's not just Elon. Uh, I mean, Jeff Bezos is silent, but he's doing really nice, nice, interesting things. What is fascinating there is what Adam was saying the ability to bring the learning of the software.com revolution into the space, into space technology. So all the things that they have learned, the Elon learned with PayPal and its, its trajectory into software, bringing them into SpaceX. So before, before I came to Australia, I was a, a rocket, a rocket girl. So I was working for a company that was doing it in um, a part of, of rockets, okay? That is the injector. So it's a tiny part of a massive rocket. And something that always fascinates me, so this is a two European rocket, uh, Vega and uh, Ariane 5. Something that really fascinates me all the time when I was, when I was, you know, that's probably 10 years ago, is that there were 25 to 60 companies in Europe working on the same rocket, okay? So we were doing the ignition system, someone else was doing the tank, uh, and there were these eternal meetings, okay, eternal, just to have an interface working between two subsystems, 
and then there was the eternal meeting if you add one and other subsystems every part was built in different countries this is how rockets are usually built so uh, when i started pulling elon and understanding that he was putting everything under one uh, shed for me it was fascinating to start with was fascinating for people that have been in rocket industry since you know, I, I, for me, since I was born, because it's my love, that's where the first things are really fascinating. So I am, uh, I don't think that Elon, and this is, I, I think he is a hero and, and he's such an inspiration, but what he did is not inventing some crazy new technologies, because he didn't. So what he did is actually creating a different way to building rockets, having all of them under the shed, having the supply chain all controlled and vertically integrate. So that was a concept that is very, very important in space, the vertical integration. And when you talk about satellites launched by, by, by rockets and, you know, using rockets, this all vertical integration, building ground station, building satellites, building rocket, is the ability to control the, entri the, entri the, the entire train. Um, Elon did not invent some crazy plasma rocket that they will bring us to Mars. His rocket is, is very simple, it's reusable. So it, what it change is, is the metric of space. So how fast you can build a rocket, everyone under a shed, and uh, how fast you are able, uh, no, how fast, uh, the economic of scale. So how, you know, bringing something back, how, how fast you can relaunch it, and how fast, how, how much money you can spend. Um, and I find this fascinating because I'm a rocket scientist by background, and my expectation about space is always that someone one day we build a plasma rocket, you know, with, with, with an amazing fusion engine that it able to just don't lose pieces. The losing pieces concept is, is very, un, it, it, it's old, yeah. okay? But Elon didn't care. He didn't care about building something that would take 50 years of R&D. He wanted to disrupt the way things were done. So in the way he's vertically integrated, he can go to Mars. In the way he's building stuff, he can do whatever he wants. So his dream is fascinating. And what I believe about him, that he vertically integrates everything. So he's going to Mars, it's not just about the rocket, it's just not about the satellites. It's about the tunnel under Mars and his boring company. It's a lot about the, the, you know, he's got a company that connects um, um, signals and stuff. This is all about robotic and automation, Tesla. So everything that he does, it's, it's, a, it's a pyramid of a peak of a dream. To create a civilization on Mars. So it's vertically integrated. So if, if you know the industry, you know that what it's doing is very profoundly different to what was happening before. So it's such a big dream that just can happen building all the pieces of the puzzle. I do not think that, that Elon is so interested in the Tesla car. I think he's interested in battery solution to bring them to Mars. You know what I mean? All right, that was, that's perfect uh, segue. I think uh, Stephen Marshall has now joined us. So good morning, Premier. Good morning. I'm sorry. I was uh, a little bit late this morning. Um, that's all right. Just, I, I didn't a lot of restrictions in South Australia at the moment. But I'm sort of running around the place, but I'm so pleased to be uh, on this webinar this morning. Thank you for yeah, inviting me. No, we'll have to uh, drag your head out of coronavirus into the space industry, which I'm sure is uh, a lot more um, fun for you. Yeah, we are so excited. Uh, in South Australia. I think the entire nation is really excited about the opportunities in space ever since the announcement was made uh, at the IAC in, in 2017. I think um, we've become very, very excited about the opportunities that exist for our nation. And of course, uh, every state plays their role, but we're very, very excited to uh, have the, the headquarters for the Australian Space Agency here and also uh, Mission Control, uh, the Space Discovery Centre, and of course, the great work of the the smart satellite CRC. So um, yeah, very, very happy and all things in space are very interesting to me. Yeah, good. Well, ho hopefully you know the, the panel. You'll, I'm sure you know Flavia. She's, a, uh, she's one of your neighbours, I think. Uh, Martin, I suspect you, if you come across, he's, he's part of the, the team behind Mariota uh, and Adam's up in Queensland, but uh, again, pretty passionate backer of the industry. Uh, and I should add, uh, add, just before I throw a question to you, Stephen, that I mean, like your support and passion for the startup industry is amazing. Every time I've come to Adelaide, I think I've bumped into you in some kind of startup related environment. So uh, you obviously love it. Uh, you know, you, you come along to a couple of our dinners, just, you know, no minders, rock up, just wanted to be part of it. So thank you from the startup ecosystem for uh, 
you know, it's not that I speak on behalf of it, but I guess I am a voice in that, but it's been fantastic having you as part of this. So um, with that preamble, uh, I might just throw with a more specific question, uh, which I was going to throw to the rest of the panel, but I might start with you, um, Stephen. So just around talent. Uh, I mean, the, the fact is that there is now a, um, uh, a, a cluster of industry um, emerging, uh, particularly in South Australia. So you, you might want to touch on that. Do we have enough space talent coming in? Is there something special about space engineers that are different to other engineers? And, you know, is our visa situation where it should be to be able to, to, to deal with this? So, yeah, Stephen, broad question, but I might throw it to you first if that's all right. You know, Ian, it's a really good question. Skills are going to be critical for us to achieve our full ambition in terms of space. We do have some very, very talented uh, people uh, in this sector most of them on your webinar uh, this morning uh, or listening in. So we are very fortunate to have some great talent in this country, but there's no doubt um, this is a massively expanding opportunity. So we need more people. Now that will be a combination uh, of people that we can develop here uh, in Australia and people that we bring in from overseas. So in terms of developing people here in Australia, I don't think we're going to have uh, too much of a problem. I know that when I'm out talking to groups at school or even at university, you mention the word space or satellites and their eyes light up. So I think now that this opportunity is there, we're going to see a lot of people graduating uh, over to that. But I think that there is going to be a short term uh, where we, we are going to need to bring some people in. It's really important that we get the visa um, uh, sort of strategy right on this to be able to bring in people with significant talent where we do have that skill deficit in Australia. Um, in our state, we have negotiated what's called a DARMA, a Designated Area Migration Agreement, where we can identify skill deficiencies and get a fast track uh, visa to work uh, here uh, in South Australia. So hopefully that will go some way to addressing uh, the skill deficit, but the longer term ambition is to make sure that we can get the right skills developed here uh, in South Australia, move people from one sector over uh, to uh, the space sector. Uh, that's really uh, important. So I think they would be the critical points that I would make at this stage, but I'm sure your panel has got other suggestions. Adam, I mean, you're obviously out recruiting. I mean, is there something unique about space scientists or space engineers that you're looking for? And like, what's your view on the visa situation? Yeah, we're looking for experience. Um, I have a firm view that, you know, if you've seen a, a rocket engine blow up or, or, or something fail, you learn from that and you just can't get that straight out of university. So we've needed to bring in foreign talent into the company uh, from other rocket companies. So we we brought people in from SpaceX and Rocket Lab and RVO uh, and a few others. Um, and our model is based to use these senior people to train up younger Australians uh, who, are, who, are, who are coming up very, very well. We've got some people in the company now that we pulled out of university three years ago that are very, very good rocket engineers now. Um, and the visa situation hasn't been too bad. We were lucky and got approved to do this GTS visa thing, um, which means that we can hire up to five uh, senior engineers a year into the business very, very, very quickly. Um, the quickest I've ever got someone done is we submitted all the documents and the very next day they were approved. That is fantastic. That's Singapore style uh, quickness and approval of visas. So uh, I think that's something that we have to stay on top of. We have to make sure we still bring in foreign talent to grow this industry because there's experiences out there. But in five or 10 years, the ecosystem should be big enough that we don't have to do that so much anymore. Yeah. But I think, Adam, there's a short term impact right now with coronavirus, I think, that, which has meant that it's, I know in your situation, you've had people that you wanted to bring in, but obviously with travel restrictions, it's a little bit harder at the moment. So there may be a bit of a, until we figure out what the international travel situation is over the next, say, six to 12 months, it's, it's a bit challenging, right? Yeah. Mm. All right, sorry, my internet was just playing up a little bit there. Uh, all right, let's keep rolling on. I, I, we, we've, got, we've got some good questions coming in from the, uh, from the audience. So if you do have a question, just please put it in the chat. Uh, let me ask one that uh, 
has come in from Michael Lucas. Uh, and I might start with you, um, Stephen, as well. So what's the role of government uh, in helping to bridge the financial gap between the, you know, Martin alluded to the, the multiple years of development it takes to, to get a, a, a startup to fully commercialized. Is there a special role for government in the space industry? I think there is a very uh, special role. We've seen already uh, the number one uh, issue addressed, and that is that we have a space agency. So that's uh, the first issue that needed to be addressed. The second is to make sure uh, that we have uh, got adequate programs in place. Now, some of those will uh, be grants. Uh, some of them uh, will be regulatory arrangements. Probably the most important thing is working with uh, federal governments uh, that purchase uh, and what we do need is the federal government to um, make decisions uh, that de uh, enable us uh, to develop a sovereign space uh, capability here uh, in Australia. It's, it's obviously very tempting for the federal government to um, purchase uh, these uh, capabilities from overseas where there is a long heritage, uh, space flight heritage, which I think is a very logical thing uh, to have on a request uh, for tender, but it does lock a lot of opportunities for Australia out, especially opportunities that are going to give us uh, the opportunities to develop that sovereign capability. So I think probably the number one thing that we need from the federal government is a recognition uh, around purchasing uh, and how Australian uh, companies and consortia can get involved uh, in developing that capability because then as a nation, uh, we end up much better off down the track. Yeah, <clears throat> I, we, we talked before the, the mics came on about the, the, the grants that were just uh, announced last week. So you know, I might throw it to the, the, the startups uh, like uh, Flavia and, and Adam in this one. So you saw these, the grant announcement, I think it was 11 million bucks of, 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 of subsidy. What do you think of that? It's, uh, it's the beginning, so that's my comment. 11 million was the first grant that they gave out. There is gonna be 150 coming uh, with an agreement with, with um, Artemis, that is the American mission to bring humans back to the moon and eventually back, back to Mars for the first time. So 11 million was the first um, step. Uh, I think 10 or 11 companies won pieces of pieces of that 11 million. Uh, after it's going to be a program very interesting that is going to invest in supply chain demonstrator and what is called trailblazer. So giving company the ability to actually do a moon mission and collaborate with um, international space agencies to put something on the moon. Um, I, I mean, you know me, and I'm a big profound believer on commercial space. So um, I think that when you bridge the gap, between what space builds and what mining builds and energy builds. And uh, you know, when the gap is, is, is it's, it's gone, then commercialization happen. Um, so it's very, very important that a space agency keeps being focused on that. When you look at the moon mission, um, Australia is so well positioned. We, we, uh, there was a call uh, last week in which actually um, NASA is, is struggling uh, for everyone saying, we can do this, we can every country in the world, but Australia has got the most advanced remote operations in mining and you know, water management and automation. It's so well positioned to play such a big role in, um, in, the, in, in the moon, on the moon mission, and just be completely unique. So I really hope that the space agency will keep focusing on commercializing um, and bridging the gap. If I look at the 11 million, there were some interesting projects. Uh, it's, it's a bit disappointing that many of them go to very early R&D research. I don't think that should be the space agency um, goal there. There are other, many other grants, you know, there's Mars CRC and the RARC. So there are many other grants that can support early stage universities. Um, so the space agencies who pump money into making companies successful. We don't have ever to forget that SpaceX um, reach what they reach with three and a half billions and just one billion from VCs. <laughs> the rest came from the from the government. So um, I really hope that, that the space agency keep being very focused on this. Yeah. Okay. Right, can me, I just uh, add in yeah, just on to what Simon said? I think um, with what Stephen said before, I think government has a very important role to play as a lead customer. 
for many of these commercialization efforts where by through requirements that the government has for infrastructure or other areas, by being that lead customer, it gives that startup certainty of business where they can get going and that will then lead to other commercial solutions. I think some of the grants that are kind of be coming out or have come out of the space agency and even some of the moon to Mars things, well, really great to build up capability and some supply components that I think will be awesome for Australia to be part of those missions. What we as an investor look for is, can those be recurring revenue streams? Can they build companies that can be long-term sustainable? So not just supply one component for say a moon to Mars mission, but like what comes after that? How could that company then springboard that into a long-term sustainable, some product offering that can be generally applicable. And that's what, as an investor, we're looking for. Yeah, I, if I jump in, I totally agree with what Martin just said. And I think that's my disappointment in the ISI. I've been talking to the space agency and the federal government that Australia has a quite early space industry, but there's a few companies that have put a lot of money and, and effort into getting technology to a reasonably high level and that's who I think the space agency should support first to make sure that they succeed, that they have a repeatable commercial model and not put a whole lot of money into early stage companies and early stage R&D because there's no visibility on you know, some of these projects. How can you ever make a massive business out of that? And I think that's the big difference that we have to see. Yeah. All right, let's um, keep rolling. There's few, some good questions coming in. So thank you, audience. Uh, there's one in from Jun Chong. Uh, what competitive advantage does the Australian space ecosystem uh, have for local space companies to compete globally? So Ms. Stephen, let me maybe start with you in that one. Just a question on our global competitiveness. I'm not a subject matter expert, but what I've learned is that we do have really good capability uh, in Australia around small satellites, smart satellites, nano satellites, um, and that's the way that the world is going at the moment. So we're moving away from, uh, you know, a, a small number of very large satellites to a very large number of small satellites, and that's very good because that's an area where we do have uh, I think a, a, a competitive advantage. That's a, an area where we do have real capability and I've heard this not just from people here uh, in the Australian space ecosystem but when I've been overseas people have sought me out uh, spoken to me about some of the capability uh, that we have here and we know some of the global uh, companies the global players are investing here in Australia because of our capability in that in, in this area so I think this is an area where we can really shine in the future here yeah Anyone else want to jump in on that? Global? Yeah, I'll jump in. I yeah. get asked that all the time. I think it's not about the technology base that you start from. It's your attitude and the access to resources you have. I think Australian space companies are scrappy yeah. in a positive way. Yeah. And I've employed people from SpaceX and they said SpaceX is scrappy. What does scrappy means? It means, you know, find the solution no matter what. Don't worry about obstacles find something that works, not necessarily the highest performance. And that's kind of what an ecosystem needs when it's, when it's growing up and when it's trying to, to take on the giants. And I think I see that all over the place, not just in our company, but in all of, all of the companies in Australia, that they're scrappy, they're hungry, they have access to technology, we have access to talent, we have access to financial money, and that's all we need to win. And as an investor, Adam, I think for us, it means that Australian companies are typically capital efficient. So an Australian startup will get to a certain point with way less capital, I think having been deployed than say a US company. So that's, as an investor, that's great because we can, that money goes further to develop something that it would say in a in different jurisdiction. Yep. Um, all right, here's another question from Roger Kermode. Hey Roger, um, when can we expect to see a regularly operational Australian based launch facility, either for satellites or humans? So. Uh, Adam, I think you might have a... So, there's a few launch sites um, being d discussed. There's one in, in Steve Marshall's uh, wonderful state, uh, Southern Launch down at Whaler's Way, that's great for um, orbital shots to sun synchronous or polar orbits where a lot of satellites go. I really hope that that's operational in the next 12 to 18 months. Uh, we do intend to launch some of our rockets from there. Uh, we're trying to get our first rocket operational in 2022 and start regular commercial services a year afterwards. Um, so that's, that's the timelines I'm looking at. Okay. 
Any like Stephen, you've got a view on that? Have you been to a, a rocket launch and uh, or is that your ambition? Go to a few rocket launches in South Australia? Yeah, I definitely would like to go to a rocket launch in Australia, and in particular one that's in in South Australia. And, and I think that Southern Launch and what they're proposing at Whalers Way uh, is fantastic, and also up at Caniba at the moment. Um, but there are others in Australia that are in in development, and I think we've got to make sure that we're not too parochial uh, about this. Uh, sector. Um, I must say, I, I love going and visiting uh, Adam's uh, facility up there in Queensland. I felt very proud uh, as an Australian. Uh, so I think we've got to sort of forget about the uh, being too uh, parochial. What we need is launch capability in Australia, and we probably need um, some uh, capability that is polar uh, oriented, some that's equatorial uh, oriented. Uh, I think that, uh, as I was saying before, uh, we are moving to a situation where there is going to be, there are going to be a lot of spacecraft up there. There's going to be a lot of uh, satellites up there and we've got to have a cost effective uh, way of getting them uh, into orbit. And we've got to have a way of doing that in a timely uh, way. And that's going to massively improve uh, the commerciality. So we're working very closely uh, with the space agency uh, and also uh, the, uh, the Southern launch at a state level and at a federal level in terms of getting those planning uh, approvals uh, through, but also uh, the regulatory approvals through from the space agency. But yeah, I can't wait to go uh, to a, a launch. I think it'll be a very proud day for Australia. Yeah, no, uh, I'm looking forward to that as well. Uh, just, uh, I mean, the last three months have, have shown that uh, we're able to function. I mean, it might not be as that optimal function, and I'm, I'd certainly miss the human contact, but uh, as an industry, and I'm talking more broadly in startup sense, but space would be included in that, we can function without having to meet face-to-face. -face. So the question is really going to be around the, the, this clustering effect. I mean, the reality is South Australia has become the de facto space capital uh, of Australia. Uh, is that going to remain? Uh, how important is that? You know, because we've, we've seen that around the, the other major capitals with the startup hub in Sydney and, um, you know, what LaunchVic is doing in uh, in, in Victoria and in Melbourne, and of course, Lot 14 and things around uh, South Australia. So questions and clustering. Uh, Stephen, it's, it's maybe appropriate to start with you and then we'll, we'll throw it to the rest of them. I think, look, again, I don't want to be too um, me, me, me uh, about, uh, you know, South Australia. I think, you know, we're, we're too small as a country to break it down even smaller, but there are some natural advantages with South Australia just with regards to our scale. I mean, you know, we all know each other very well. There are some advantages with being able to bounce ideas off. Lot 14 is quite unique because on that site, seven hectares in the centre of the city, you've got a space agency, the SmartSat CRC, you've got MIT's Living Lab, you've got Stone and Chalk, 600 desk incubator accelerator, you've got the Australian Cyber Collaboration Centre, uh, you've got the Australian Institute of Machine Learning, and so you've got some of the the best and brightest people interacting with companies like Miriota and Innovor and Neumann Space, you've got them all bouncing off each other. And of course, they suck a lot of other people in from other companies around Adelaide. It's not such a big place. So they suck a lot of people in for events. And so we're very well connected. And I've been amazed at that spontaneous interaction between people in South Australia that you may not see, you know, in another country, another city around the world where it's just, you know, space is a smaller proportion of what's going on and that interactivity doesn't occur. So I think we're very fortunate. But I also think um, that opportunities using technology like this to get out and speak to lots more people are, are going to help. Things like the Space Forum that we hold in Adelaide twice a year are great opportunities to bring uh, the sector together. So I think there's, I think there's lots of opportunities for us to um, grow the sector here in South Australia, but do that as part of, you know, a connected up uh, ecosystem around the, the country. Uh, and of course, uh, a connected up ecosystem around the world. I mean, one of the things that I find amazing about space is um, it's, a, it's an international uh, ecosystem. Uh, when you go to the IAC, you've got people from different countries, might have different political systems, might have different uh, value systems, uh, but space tends to be one of these things which uh, unites uh, the world. And I think uh, it's a small place 
the uh, the world when you look at it from a from a space industry perspective. Uh, Adam, can can I throw to you? I mean, like you are you're kind of in Queensland, so I mean, I wouldn't say there's a space cluster there, but do you uh, long for hanging out with other space startups? Yeah, I always love going down to Adelaide and seeing all of my friends in the space industry down there. I think South Australian government's done a great job. They've had a focused uh, mission to, to bring space activities to South Australia for a long time. Um, I don't think we're going to have anything like that in Queensland, um, mainly because a lot of the companies are quite away from each other. We're in the Gold Coast, some others are in you know, North Brisbane. Um, but I'm, I'm happy with the success of, of the South Australian space community because um, I think it's good to have some centricity and, you know, I want to launch them all to space anyway. So, I, you know, I hope Stephen Marshall gets about another 10 satellite customers there that make satellites and then I'll launch all of them. Very good. <laughs> all right, love it. Let's, um, let's keep going with a few more questions. We've got a few more minutes. Uh, there's one here from uh, Deborah Kochak. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, so sorry, Deborah. Uh, where do you see the biggest needs arising in space tech that we must consider creating solutions for right now? So, yeah, I guess the question's around development. Where should development um, money be be deployed? Martin, maybe that's probably a yeah. good Yeah, I might just answer that one. Yeah, thanks. So it's what I was saying before. It's around supply chain and having a number of companies that have space-certified um, capability that they've flown before, flight certifications, those sort of things. Because what I see happen right now is that you have a startup with a great idea, they then got to figure out how can I build that into a small satellite? And then they scratch around trying to find out, is there somebody in Australia already that has knowledge of how to do that? Are they reputable enough that if, they, if that startup puts their hard earned dollars, because they've got limited funding with that other organization, can they reliably build a satellite for them that they could reliably get to space? So it's about that supply chain thing. And we need more companies that are in that early small sat building capability um, business that other companies can come to and say, I want you to build me a satellite and they can reliably go, okay, done. Because typically it's an innovation around a sensor or some communications that this, the new startup wants to have somebody put onto a satellite for them. So that's the key piece. All right, anyone else want to take a stab at that? Any tech that we're missing that, that we need? No, all right, let's keep rolling. Uh, thank you for uh, not uh, jumping in if you didn't want anything there. Uh, there's one here from Hardik, engineer, which he obviously is. What steps should I take now to get into the Australian space industry? So I guess any founders out there that wanna, or potential employees, I guess, that, that wanna get involved, what's the best way of doing it? Who wants to take that? Flavia, you're... And that's an email. Uh, got an opinion in this. You know, Fleet, Fleet in this month is hiring 10 people. Okay. Um, they weirdly... I mean, we were lucky enough to raise before the coronavirus pandemic. Um, and in a weird way, unfortunately, there's a lot of people that lost their job during this period, but it's a good opportunity for startups to grab great talent. So this is exactly what startups are for. We don't have to forget that that SpaceX it was one person and one dream, and now it's ten thousand employees. So um, we are we are we are um, hiring, and so is Adam constantly. Just send us email. What is super interesting for me when I receive emails about people that want to join the space industry is that they're not just engineers. Like Fleet has got some engineers. Um, Fleet has got marketing and sales and uh, you know now we are hiring a lot of people from the industries where we're deploying the solution so just don't be shy just just connect to us the best emails that I always get is like I love space and I want to get into the industry that's that's literally what I love uh, so giving the opportunity to everyone to give it a try and I know that you know, we went from nine people to 40, and I'm, I know that in the next 10 years, we'll hire 100 or if not 1,000 of people. So just stay close to us. The moment will come. That's why startups, this is what startups are doing incredibly well, like bring everyone in the journey, you know? So don't be shy, just send us an email, really. All right, uh, there's a question just came in on the on the chat there from Senthu Jega. Uh, should space tech or other studies be part of the school curriculum? Stephen? Well, we have got a secondary school in South Australia, Hamilton Secondary High School, uh, which has got a fantastic program. It's not part of a subject that you study uh, for two years, but it is 
It is a nicely developed uh, curriculum. We're seeing a lot of students from other schools uh, going to Hamilton as part of that program. We've had a group that have come in from the UAE uh, to study uh, at Hamilton High. So I think it's going to be more and more uh, involved. I think the Artemis uh, program is going to capture the imagination of the entire world. Uh, so I think we're going to be talking about that for uh, some uh, time and I think it's naturally going to embed itself in into curriculum. But we've been uh, very pleased with the work at Hamilton High School. If, you, if people on this uh, on this uh, webinar haven't seen it, I suggest they get down and take a look. And of course, at the moment, we're in the final stages of concluding the design for the Space Discovery Centre, uh, which is going to be uh, also at Lot 14, adjacent to where the Australian Space Agency uh, is located. And I think that will be, all right, not embedded into curriculum, but I think it will be a real resource uh, for teachers. And I'm sure what they will develop as part of that is an outreach so that people that can't come physically to the Space Discovery Centre can get an appreciation for their study or just for their personal interest. Yeah. All right, we're just about time. So um, I think I might just uh, move to, you know, try and fit, well, I'll just try and finish on a, on, a, on a high note. I mean, I think the most inspiring thing that I certainly find about space is getting humans up there. Uh, I mean, it's such a difficult endeavour. I mean, getting anything into orbit apparently is just incredibly hard. So. Um, when, maybe I'll throw this one to you, Adam, because I know you're working on it, but when can I buy a berth on one of your rockets and go and stand on my moon, uh, stand on the moon and achieve my bucket list item? Well, I think we, we'll be able to take you to space in about 10 years uh, to an orbital space. I think if, if you wanted to go suborbital, you could do it a lot quicker. Um, I don't have plans on taking people to the moon yet, so it'll have to probably be with Elon. But if you want to go to low Earth orbit, 10 years is a nice stretch target for us. Right. Well, I think, uh, I think Adam, you could get him there sooner if you didn't want to worry about coming back. Because, I mean, <laughs> I'm sure Ian's less than 100 kilos, so pff, not a problem, right? And also, Adam, you know, you can go faster into space if Martin gives you more money. So it's all good. Money, yeah. It's all about money. We need, we need money to do that. But it probably should come from the government. Uh, and Stephen, <laughs> life after politics, uh, are you keen to go to the moon? <laughs> it's not on my bucket list. I've got a long list of people that I'd like to send to the moon. <laughs> uh, look, I'm just fascinated. I, you know, the great thing about being the premier of a state is you can choose your own portfolios. And I appointed myself as the minister for space in South Australia. Um, I've had a fascination with space. We, of course, have that wonderful heritage. Uh, in South Australia uh, with the space industry going back 50 years ago uh, with RESAT uh, uh, and other uh, great advances that Australia had uh, at that time. We've had Andy uh, Thomas, but may mainly I look at it from a, a jobs perspective, inspiring the next generation. What we want to do in South Australia uh, is uh, we're going to be always respectful to our traditional sectors, ag and mining and construction and manufacturing, but there's something really, I think, um, exciting about looking at the future industries, whether it be defence or space or cyber, machine learning. Uh, and that's why I've taken on space, because I think it's going to inspire that next generation. And for young people at school now to, that, are, that are fascinated with space uh, and captivated by space and motivated uh, to get a career in that, they can actually have that career in Australia. And that really excites me. Yeah. Well, and I, look, I really appreciate it. I mean, it's, uh, this is a big job that you have, and I, and I do appreciate the fact that you uh, took the time to, 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 to join us, um, Stephen. So thank you. I want to make sure we finish in time, so I think we will wrap there. So I just want to say a huge thank you to our entire panellists, so Martin, Adam, Flavia, and, of course, uh, Stephen Marshall. So uh, that was terrific. Let me just uh, switch back to the slides and just do the quick wrap. So um, if you're around tomorrow. Uh, we've got our regular event with AWS. So uh, tune in at lunchtime and you can uh, meet Jacqueline Purcell, who's from, from Deputy. Uh, it's a masterclass in funding from a CFO's perspective. So, um, you know, how, how do you use your numbers to support the storytelling of your organization, which is uh, important. Uh, we're, we're doing another panel next week. So um, Stephen alluded to it, cybersecurity. Uh, we're joined by James Cameron, uh, who's from Airtree, Mike 
Bouks, who's from Upguard, a uh, great company. Casey Ellis, again, another fantastic company. Um, and Jessica Glenn, who is an expert in this. She, she sort of uh, deciphered the, uh, the coronavirus uh, um, contact tracing app uh, with uh, a few others. So it's a fascinating journey. She's really, really good. So very excited about that one next week. So same time, same place. Uh, we've just released a new episode of the podcast. So Sam Chandler from Nitro, uh, amazing business and an amazing story. So Faden uh, goes goes deep with with him, uh, and that's well worth a well worth a listen. Uh, if you've got a few minutes now, please ju um, jump on and join us in Discord and have a chat to some others from the the ecosystem. And then finally, look, thank you again to our national sponsors: uh, Macquarie, KPMG, High Growth Ventures. AWS and Farmark uh, Ventures. So thank you panelists and thank you audience. Uh, that was a lot of fun. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day um, uh, and keep doing what you're doing. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Bye.